the radiance, you integrate it over the solid angle, and you'll get the scalar irradiance. And this is sort of the basis of what you use for photosynthesis or heating of water. And then there's a couple of other things you're going to see referred to in the literature. One of them is called the vector irradiance. And so there you take the radiance times the cosine without the uh, absolute value signs. And really what you're doing is you're integrating the radiance times the direction C well, this really has Cx, x hat plus Cy, y hat plus Cz, z hat. And so you're multiplying that times the radiance, integrating over a solid angle. So you get an x and a y and a z component of an irradiance. But people normally only look at the z component. And so then remember this Cz was cos and theta, and then uh, the d omega, the radiance integrated over direction. So if you just put in the cos and theta here, integrate over uh, all directions, over all solid angles, or you integrate 0 to 90 with a plus cosine, and then from 90 to 180, the cosine is negative, and you really have ED minus EU. This is really the Z component of the vector irradiance, which is usually called the net irradiance. And why that's important is we'll see this thing called Gershon's Law, that it relates the absorption coefficient to the scalar irradiance and the depth derivative of ED minus EU. We'll derive that in a couple of days. But anyway, what it says is if you have an ecosystem model, for example, and you want to figure out how much light's absorbed to grow your phytoplankton, what you really need to know is the depth dependence of this net irradiance ED minus EU and the scalar irradiance, and then that'll tell you how much light was absorbed. So you're not actually measuring the absorption coefficient, you're only measuring light field quantities, but from those you can get absorption. And uh, so that gets used in ecosystem models a lot. And then I mentioned also there was something called the spectral intensity, which is the power emitted by a small or point source per unit steradian. So there's no per unit area here. So it's joules per second emitted per steradian per wavelength band. And that's what's properly called intensity. And a lot of people use the word intensity to mean a magnitude, but that's totally wrong in radiative transfer theory. And there's actually a guy published a paper on the misuse of the word intensity, that intensity should only mean uh, watts per steradian, it's not the magnitude. Just say magnitude of, of the irradiance or magnitude of the radiance was whatever. Don't say the intensity of the radiance was because that doesn't make sense. Okay, and you know, as Confucius told us, the beginning of wisdom is to call a thing by its proper name. So if you call in a paper, you say, I measured whatever and the intensity was and there's a plot and I look at that and I say, wait a minute, he's got units of watts per square meter per nanometer, that's not an intensity, that's an irradiance. So it's, for a guy like me whose brain only works in one particular way, I look at that and say, well, did the guy really measure intensity or did he measure something else? And I once used, misused that word in front of Craig Boren and he came down on me heavy and I've never misused it since. Um, okay, now a little bit about photosynthesis to set you guys up for that. Uh, as I said, radiometry that we've been talking about always uses energy units, but photosynthesis depends on the number of photons detected. So that's using some kind of quantum units, or if you wish, how many photons are absorbed without thinking about what a photon really is. We'll just absorb them and use them. 
And so there's what's called the photosynthetically available radiation, or PAR. It says, I'll take my radiometer, I'll measure the spectral scalar irradiance, I don't care what direction the light's coming from, and then that's in energy units. I'm now going to divide that by the energy per photon, divide this by hc over lambda, energy per photon, so I just multiplied it here. And this little integration then from say 400 to 700 converts energy units into numbers of photons per square meter per second. So this often, you know, this will be a number like 10 to the 20th or something. So PAR is often expressed in Einstein's per square meter per second, where an Einstein is by definition one mole of photons or Avogadro's number of photons. And usually it's more like micro Einstein's is the convenient, you know, number for using in a paper. Um, this is used par, notice it's a broadband thing. You've integrated over all wavelengths. So you've lost any information about the wavelength dependence of the light. And of course, some people use 350 to 700, some use 400 to 700. You know, the biologists can argue about what's really relevant. The later ecosystem models are starting now to use spectral scalar irradiance. So they take the E0 radiometric thing, they convert it to photons, but they don't integrate over the wavelength. They use the wavelength distribution of the photon scalar irradiance. And why do you do that? Well, it's because different phytoplankton have different pigments. So if you're in one environment and your phytos have a pigment that sucks up blue light and you're in clear water, there's a lot of blue light, they'll be happy. If you go over into another environment where it's maybe higher chlorophyll and you've got a lot of green light, but there the phytoplankton have some pigment that absorbs green light, then they'll have a competitive advantage over one that can only you know, use mostly blue light. So in order to be able to model uh, the competition between phytoplankton that have different pigment suites in a given environment, you need to use the spectral light. And some models are starting to do that now. So just keep that in mind. Okay, I've already warned you a little bit about terminology. If you go to atmospheric optics, they call the radiance the specific intensity. They call irradiance flux. But the catch is some people call irradiance flux and some call it flux density. And then you go to the medical optics and astrophysics and all of that, they're all talking about exactly the same thing and they have entirely separate terms. Like you read a medical paper, people have actually used hydrolyte for modeling things like light penetration into skin. But they talk about fluence rates. And like I read the paper, I'm like, what the hell is a fluence rate? You know, when you back up and, you know, a day later you finally figured out, oh, that's their term for an irradiance. But uh, it's very confusing, just be forewarned. The other thing is spectral versus band integrated. So the spectral downwelling plane irradiance is per unit wavelength interval with these units. Then if you have a band integrated value, you take that, you integrate it over whatever wavelength band you're interested in, and now you have watts per square meter. And I have had innumerable like hydrolyte users say, well, I ran hydrolyte and I compared it with my irradiances and they're off by a factor of 10. Like, well, okay, tell me about your instrument. Oh, well, it's a whatever. Okay, well, what are the units coming out of that instrument? And every time the answer will be, um, I don't know, I'll check with my technician. And then they come back and they say, oh, it's uh, measuring uh, microwatts per square centimeter per second. Okay, cool. Well, there's a like factor of 100 conversion error. Now, is that band integrated or is that spectral? Mm, I don't know. I'll check with my technician. And then they come back and say, well, I called the company and they said it's a band integrated value. Okay, cool. And what's the wavelength of your, oh, well, it's 10 nanometers. Okay, then you need to take your band integrated value and divide by 10 
to compare it with hydrolite, which is a spectral version, not a band integrated version. So you can spend like half of the week figuring out, is my instrument actually putting out a spectral irradiance or is it band integrated and what are the units? Because hydrolite uses SI units, watts per square meter per nanometer. It's perfectly fine to use milliwatts per square centimeter per micrometer or something. You just have to do the conversion before you get to hydrolite. And so I often get papers, they'll have a plot and it'll say irradiance versus wavelength, period. And I say, well, what irradiance? Is it downwelling, upwelling, scalar? Oh, well, you know, I don't know. It's like, oh, oh, it's a downwelling plane irradiance. Okay, all you have to do in the paper is say, we measured the downwelling spectral plane irradiance in units of, and you're done. Then I know exactly what you have. And if you want to call that Q or something, I don't care. But at least I know what the symbol stands for. If I don't know what the symbol stands for, paper rejected. Okay, as you know, I always put a pretty picture into my lectures so you have something to look forward to. So a few years ago, it was rainy in Seattle and a bunch of us decided we should go to Panama. So we went to Panama City here. We took a little plane over to the Caribbean side and there's a big area of Panama here called the Comarca de Cunayala, which means the autonomous region of the Cuna. And the Indians, the Kuna Indians, were never conquered by the Spaniards. They enjoyed putting poison arrows into Spaniards, and they were blessed by not having any gold on their land. So the Spaniards just decided, these dudes are not worth dealing with, leave them alone. And so now there's a big region of Panama here that is sort of what we would call in the U.S. an Indian reservation. But the Kuna Indians in this area they do not pay Panamanian taxes. They don't vote in Panamanian elections. They run their own show, pretty much independent of the rest of Panama. And you cannot go there without their permission. So you have to hire a kuna to go with you as a guide to make sure you don't rip off any you know, graves or anything. So anyway, we flew over. We landed on a little dirt airstrip. We spent a week kayaking island to island back to where there was actually a road the only road back to the rest of Panama and we came home. And you see here there's a little island and you see a little house on the island here and some coconut palms. So the Kuna Indians, they, there's hundreds of these little islands. Each family gets an island and then your income is raising coconuts and selling the coconuts to the tourists back in Panama City. And then every few years all the families rotate and you get a new island. So that's so nobody has a good island versus a bad island for very long. And you can pull up to any of these places and for about five bucks a night, they'll let you camp on their island. There's the only water here is there will be a little lens of fresh water under the, the island. So if you go out in the middle of these sand islands and you dig down a couple of meters, you'll actually hit fresh water. That's a little lens of water that's left there by hurricanes coming through now and then. So anyway, it's a, it's a different world than living in New York City or Shanghai or somewhere, that this is your, you know, where you live. And yeah, you can always get in your little boat, which I don't, there's one right there, and you can go over to the mainland and, you know, visit your relatives or whatever, but it's quite an interesting place. So 